edu slash hubs um, or hub both lead to the same place um, and that's a space where you can look at uh, patron art that was submitted to our uh, quarantine webzine uh, which was put together by a couple of my colleagues in a really cool way uh, here at the libraries and we held an opening night uh, exhibition opening uh, within Mozilla hubs within a custom hub that we were able to build actually maybe that's a great place to start our um, work today is to go take a look at what exactly we can do with these hubs so here you can see I've gone to a URL it's as easy as going to any other website I'm gonna elect not to use virtual reality uh, because I do have a headset hooked up but I don't think it would be the best experience for you all to watch as I use a headset on my screen um, you can see these blocks indicate that there's some media loading into the scene it gives a really nice um, uh, mechanism for content that hasn't fully loaded to not completely bog down and crash the site. I think it's one of the really cool things is how many different qualities of internet uh, can access these spaces and make use of them. So I'm going to, uh, what we have built here is really a space template more than anything. Um, so on opening night of the, of this exhibition, that link went, everybody was going into the same room. That was easy to do just via link forwarding essentially. Um, but here we've left the space up as a template so that you can spin up an instance of this room and just host you and your closest friends there rather than going into kind of the, the big pool that is the internet sometimes. Uh, so we're trying to allow people to create spaces that fit the needs that they have uh, while still being in something, you know, like a library space, like a gallery space. Um, I think maybe for today's session, we'll look at making a meeting space um, so that if you and your group of friends are meeting to work on a school assignment, um, to talk about a business you're spinning up, to just play video games online because you all miss each other. Um, I know my friends have been uh, electing more and more often to run one of these rooms in the background as we play Steam games or whatever because um, we like the voice chat so much. There's spatialized voice chat within this room that kind of responds to the room itself and can, in my opinion, is higher quality than a lot of video chat services. So you can see that we're the, we have a first person perspective into a Mozilla hub here. And this is one, uh, all the work that we're seeing here along the walls, I'm gonna make sure that we show the big artist citation area because this is some really cool stuff that we have in here. We have some photographs, some kind of infographics, um, some really neat poetry from some students and other patrons, a lot of staff, NC State staff uh, submitted work to this, and we were able to kind of host it all alongside uh, of each other. And there's, of course, the uh, libraries also released a more uh, sort of standard format zine, I think, where it's page by page and things share space in that way, but we're also able to spatialize a lot of um, our content as well. So I want to make sure that I get a little uh, citation moment here. I'm going to leave that on there. And these are all folks who are um, cool enough to contribute to this hub. And so now we're able to represent all of their work within a virtual reality space that can be visited. And you know, we're using NC State's awesome GoLink system, which I know is present in other universities as well and other organizations. Uh, link forwarding plays so nicely with hubs. Um, just the ability to send people through to kind of these more obtuse sort of URLs that get generated um, through, uh, you know, this, the appearance of a standard or of a, a steady portal to them. Um, you can see a little bit of dynamic lighting where we have a dy dynamic light that uh, corresponds to this light. So it appears that this light in the photo is giving some uh, emissive light there. I'm not sure if you all can hear the lovely singing. It looks like it can. It looks like it's coming through the stream. So I'll shut up for a moment. But you can see how my motion away from that sound source transfers into the um, content as it carries over. Um, so I think that's pretty neat. And you're able to run video right in the scene. And I cannot believe how good video looks um, running in these scenes. So there's lots that we're really impressed about um, within Hubs. I really do think it's one of the really outstanding tools that's out there online right now in order to, you know, that allow you to stay together with people in a really difficult time. Uh, and you can see why it's something we want to teach about. So in today's session, uh, we're going to go through, and I, I think maybe that's a good jumping off point. Let's make a meeting room where you uh, could meet with people. Um, this is, of course, that kind of space, but it's you know, focused a little more as a gallery. I don't think we've 
uh, optimize the space necessarily for voice or for sound to come through well. Um, it does, but it's not necessarily what we were designing for. This You saw that this room took a little while to load up. That's because of all the media that's in here. This video is gorgeous, um, but they are big. Um, so let's make something that has a little bit less um, media coming into the room. Let's try to stay within all of the best practices um, for using hubs and for building within hubs. Um, and let's see what we can make today. So uh, a little bit of house cleaning. Uh, as always, I will point out that we do have on the side of your screen, uh, you'll see the go.ncsu.edu slash Twitch folder. Uh, that is available. That is a public link. Whether or not you are an NC State user, you are welcome to check that out. I'm just keeping some running notes in that folder, um, things that I might uh, say out loud, URLs like that, that I don't think are necessarily very easy to intake um, by saying them out loud. I also have just a, a copy of some running notes that I'm going to keep uh, throughout today's stream of things that I, I w you might want to take away with you, sort of, and not have to write down as I say them on a Twitch stream. Um, as always, I encourage anybody to send a message in the chat. And we also have hello to everybody in our separate NC State chat. If anybody has a private question that they would like to ask at any point during today's session, that's a great forum to, uh, for that as well if you're one of our registered users on Reporter. Um, and yeah, I look forward to building some stuff with you today. So let's go back to that sort of home base for us. That's going to be hubs.mozilla.com. And I will even get our notes going by pointing that URL out. Excuse me for just a moment as we get that up and running. Cool. Oh, and it looks like I'm going to use last week's notes. It looks like I did a pretty good job of pointing out that URL. Um, and I have some considerations I like there. So leave those notes going. And that's in go.ncsu.edu slash Twitch folder. Okay, so uh, we have about, let's call it 40 minutes, 45 minutes, uh, in which we'll, we can build a scene. Last, uh, we do have a previous stream, if you look in my previous videos here on this Twitch channel, where we made an island scene, an island getaway, that's I've been using actually quite a bit per, in my uh, personal hubs life. I've been uh, having little island get-togethers with people. It's great for two, per, two people meetings, but let's try to build a room where maybe it's for four people to meet. So we're thinking about that kind of size. We'll have four people able to easily spawn in. Let's really emphasize voice chat um, be sounding good in the space and uh, maybe let's even uh, put some spots where we could put people's video streams on the wall I think that would be cool I've seen that in rooms so let's uh, from this hubs.mozilla.com uh, window we're going to go up to the top of the page where it says spoke spoke is actually the editor for creating these rooms um, you know, uh, as you may imagine, hubs and spoke are meant as complementary complementary pieces of software of online apps. Um, so it is actually spoke will be doing most of our work in today. Um, I do have that link. I'm highlighting it in the notes document for anybody who's following along there. I do see we have one person following along there. Um, if you click that button, that's going to take you right to the spoke homepage. Um, and I'm going to try to leave maybe. 180 seconds here. If you've followed through to that spoke homepage already, there's a login in the top corner. Um, I'd really advise you to use that. Um, it's going to let you save all of your projects. I just gave away what email I use, but I'm going to tab over and confirm that link myself so I can get logged in and access a lot of my old assets. But if you want to go ahead and sign in, um, you don't have to do a account setup or anything. It just authenticates that you belong to the email that you put in. Um, really worth it. You can see some super secret projects I have going here. So, um, and I clicked uh, new project on that next window. I'm going to give everyone a moment to stay with us here. And then I'm also going to click new empty project. So I'm just going to give a moment while we make sure everybody made it through that step because I would hate to lose you this early on. And I know it does take a moment longer if you haven't done that before for the email link to come through. So when you've set up an empty project, it defaults most likely. Um, I think there are places you can click that it would be a little different, but most likely you're seeing something that looks exactly like what I have here. Um, and you can see this is 
pretty typical 3D scene controls. How about as we let people uh, ensure that they're with us, I'm just gonna talk through a couple of those controls, uh, kind of reminding ourselves what the mouse does. Uh, scroll wheel is totally essential, um, and therefore I think mouse, having a mouse with you when you're doing substantial work in Spoke is really important. Um, I find it difficult to picture someone being able to construct a whole scene on a trackpad very easily. Um, I'm sure people do it, but I would really advise to have a mouse with you if possible. Uh, and one with a scroll wheel, because all of this zooming in and out I'm doing is all with the scroll wheel. I don't think I've touched another button yet, maybe. Um, and when you hold down that scroll wheel, that center click, it gives you the ability to move the whole scene, uh, which is really nice. Um, you can use your right click, kind of. I like to make the analogy that this is the right click button is moving your neck. Uh, it's, your head isn't really moving in space very much, but it, it, the orientation of its gaze is and your right click kind of does the opposite. Your orientation of gaze stays the same, but you're orbiting around whatever is at the center of your view. Um, there are some other handy little um, reminders of the clicks right here at the bottom of your screen. You'll have those. You will not be able to see those in my, in my uh, screencast right now. Uh, it's going to be way too small for you. But if you do have it open in front of you, that reminds you what the left mouse button, the middle mouse button, and right mouse button do. Um, Let's kind of go around and look at our different windows that exist within uh, Spoke. This is if you are used to working in a 3D editor, um, be it CAD, um, like some sort of, um, you know, something that's doing CAD-like design, uh, 3D printing editors. Um, there's all sorts of, you know, game engines, obviously, Unity, Unreal. You're probably used to this set of different panels um, that kind of have different functions, but let's go through what they are because they're slightly different in hubs than in any other um, editor I've used. Probably looks the most like Unity, maybe. But um, down here, this is like our home base, really. This is where the vast majority, eh, maybe not the vast majority, but when you're bringing something into a scene and you want to incorporate it in and really stitch it into the fabric of the scene, uh, this is going to be your home base. This is your elements panel and your assets panel. Um, so let's look at this left side first. These assets are different type of items uh, that you would like to bring into the scene. Here you can see a lot of personal uh, media that I've brought in that will not show up in your... Um, Oh, the music surprised me there, guys. <laughs> I hovered over it too long. Uh, that's, that's, uh, that song is also my alarm clock, so I was having uh, flashbacks to this morning. Um, so this is all media that I've brought in for different hubs. Uh, and you can drag and drop media from your computer basically into this panel. It's unbelievable how easily it comes in. It takes a lot of file formats. Um, and you can see it can take... Uh, 3D models, uh, just 2D images, PNG and JPEG. Um, PNG obviously brings uh, transparency with it, which is super valuable. We can talk about why. Um, videos, it plays videos very well. It also can uh, link out to videos, particularly on Vimeo rather than on YouTube. Uh, there are some issues with YouTube seeing hubs reaching to stream those videos as like an unapproved um, streamer and it'll like shut that connection down. Uh, I imagine they're going to fix that pretty soon. It just feels like kind of an early days thing. Um, but Vimeo does play really nicely. So you can stream video from there. You don't necessarily need to load every video into Spoke. Um, there's also audio. You can see a bunch of audio there that I'm not going to totally show off. But audio, um, you know, sound is more than half the picture, right? So uh, those can be really valuable assets within your scene. Uh, this Mozilla Architecture Kit is awesome. These are really, really low poly, which means low polygonal, a uh, low number of polygons that make up the overall mesh, right? Which makes it a lower memory usage, lower video uh, memory usage in particular. Um, these are like su basically, you know, we're going to talk about budget multiple times today. You know, there's this overall budget of you get about, you know, best practices about 15 megs of data in every in any given scene, uh, and the textures and materials need to be really simple. You don't really want to go over a resolution of about 2048 by 2048 pixels ever. Um, you start really paying a heavy tax if you do that. You get into exponential uh, territory in terms of the video RAM it uses to show multiple of those. So I usually tell myself I don't want any image to be over uh, 1,024 pixels, uh, 1024. Um, 
I'll even add that as a note in our document here. Colin's personal preference. 1024 by 1024. You'll If you uh, stick to that guideline, you will go pretty far in hubs. It can do a lot. Um, but the other item, the really important thing for three-dimensional items is that they only have one material because the number of materials that you're using in your scene overall will start to really scale how long it takes to load on people's machines. And, you know, the really exciting thing about hubs is that anyone with a web connection on, like, any web browsing device can hop in and use it and occupy the same room that you're in. Uh, and that's like, you know, on a VR headset, sure. On a powerful desktop computer, you know, I'm on a, a pretty high quality um like production computer here. It has a very good graphics card in it, but I would want to set up a room that somebody can join on their phone. Um, and if you follow these best practices, these numbers we're talking about, they're really for uh, ensuring that phone users and users with poor internet quality when they join are able to join you in your room without issue. Um, you can go above and beyond these restrictions if you're only planning on having people joining from desktops, if you're building a room that maybe isn't really a social space. You know, I've been doing a lot of filming um, TV production within hubs recently, um, and I don't really care in some of those cases whether it's able to run over the internet if other people can join in very easily. I'm doing everything locally, essentially, you know. Um, I think that's kind of an outlier case. So let's think about those best practices as kind of mandatory, but I do just want to point out that, um, you know, the recipe is for an occasion. Okay, back to looking at our kit here. I think that makes our point about the architecture kit pretty well. These are basically free in that budget of uh, memory usage, and they are really cool. There's lots of great stuff in there, so I won't go over that too long. Rock kit is essentially the same thing, <laughs> except it's not as in-depth. Uh, there's, I think, only like seven things in the rock kit, but they're handy. It's really nice. They're really um, low-poly rocks are hard to find sometimes for obvious reason. Um, Rocks are now useful for being very high poly if you check out the Unreal Engine 5 demo. Um, Sketchfab uh, and Google Poly, you can. there's an intuitive, easy way to bring in uh, assets from either Sketchfab or Google Poly. For those of you who are unfamiliar, uh, those are both services that host 3D models on the web. You can host your own models there. Um, you can access models that have been posted by other users. Um, Google Poly, I find myself using Google Poly pretty often because there's this amazing collection of like 125, maybe like 200 uh, 3D models that have been actually posted by Google and they're just like outstanding to use within hubs. So you'll, you'll see those within the hubs I make quite often. Um, but there's other low poly models out there. There's lots of low poly, really talented low poly artists, particularly on Sketchfab. Um, Sketchfab, you got to be careful. Let's grab what we think would be a really bad asset. Let's just kind of throw an asset in here. This looks really cool. I really like the sculpture. I tend to think that's probably a bunch of materials, and it's pretty high poly. Um, and shout out to Adrison, uh, who made this. Um, let's just click, and I just want to show you dropping a piece of content into our scene. We're not really to that point yet, but I want to make a point about things we'll pull from Sketchfab and Poly. So I just clicked the item, and now you can see it doesn't load until I actually click where I want to locate it. That's like a, basically making sure we're not crashing the browser. Um, it's going to take a moment now to load, and this is a good transition um, to look away from our assets where we're bringing things into the into the stew a little bit, and look over here where we can get some uh, descript to the properties tab where we can get a description of what that asset is. So you can see items come into hubs kind of at their own predetermined scale. Um, I'm not totally sure how that works. I think it's in the documentation, but I don't want to speak to it too much today. Um, that looks so awesome. They made a really cool thing there. I wonder if that's 3D scanned. It sure seems to be. Um, so let's go down. We'll look at model. And we'll click GLTF info. I love that hubs uses GLTFs for the future. And this is 33 megs. Um, so that's like over twice the memory that we've allocated for our total scene. Um, and so really cool piece of art. Probably not a great fit for what we're trying to do today. It makes the point I'm trying to make, though. What is surprising, it does only have one material. So like it, in certain ways, is kind of friendly to what we're trying to do. If it just was like more low poly, that would be great. Uh, you could always bring... a 
something like that into Blender and decimate it down. Um, if you have a CAD engine that you're familiar with that you like, if you're a 3D modeler, there's probably lots of things that come to mind immediately that you could do. Uh, a reminder to always cite anything that you're incorporating into your scene. They have some uh, really good opportunities to do that within hubs. And um, a personal note, if you ever see a scene that I've made that you don't think something is properly cited, please let me know because it can get away from you sometimes and I would hate to be stealing people's work. Okay, so let's delete that and um, my goal is here in the next five minutes, maybe we've made it through the panels, we spend 20 minutes building. Um, Google Poly works essentially the same. Uh, I believe that Google Poly has some sort of filter running on the results such that not all models that are in Google Poly will show up here in hubs. Um, you know, 99% of the time, that's pretty useful because um, it will prevent you from bringing super high poly images in, or models rather, into the scene that would like be too much for the scene and crash it. Um, so I like that filter, but it's worth pointing out that you can always go to poly, poly.google.com and take a look for yourself if you think there might be, um, I don't know, let's, keep the theme. Yeah, if you think there might be some content you'd like to use that it's not presenting to you, you see what it says for bull statue there, there were about a dozen results. Whereas here, those results have been thinned a little bit. So, you know, I kind of think the thinning was useful. Those are probably the ones I would have wanted to use, but um, worth pointing out. And I think uh, you can bring images into the scene. Uh, here it defaults to using Bing's image search. Uh, same for video. Um, I would, yeah, I, I haven't used these uh, inlaid asset um, panels very much um, for these two. I tend to bring those into my onto my own computer and edit them down for resolution's sake um, and then bring them into my assets. But I could totally use it. Uh, Hub Sound Pack is really cool. I don't want to get too into where you look online to find music beds. I think probably a future one of these streams will deal with sound quite a bit. Um, but I do just want to point out there's like, I don't know, two or three dozen different really cool music beds here. Um, I lately have really liked, I'm going to show you my favorite. I like uh, Office with Music is my, um, is my personal favorite. Ooh, yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, there's also GIFs. Um, this media, I don't use these very often yet, but I could really see myself in the future using them uh, in place of a video. Uh, if you have some sort of repeated action that's happening in the scene, like, I don't know, we just saw a water cooler, right? Like you could make the bubbles that come up from the bottom of the water cooler a GIF rather than a video. Um, I don't know too much about what which is the more optimal strategy there. That's probably something I'll share with y'all as I start to learn it from playing around more there. Okay, so those are elements. Um, let's go back up to the, or those are assets rather. Let's go up to that top elements panel because it's a nice segue. If you want to drop one of these types of media into your scene, but you don't necessarily know what the media is yet, or you like want to kind of prepare um, the scene to receive it, you can always like, and also there's certain types of media that can only be dropped like this. Um, this whole panel is just like, what, three, six, eight, like 19 things that Hubs does well and that Hubs is capable of carrying. Um, and some of them are really neat. Like the simple water and the particle emitter are just like really easy ways to get familiar with those concepts of like particle emission or um, dynamic water appearance. I, I think in our last stream, if you want to check my past videos here on Twitch, uh, we used the simple water to great effect. So I think we'll stay away from that today. Uh, maybe we'll stay away from the particle emitter as well because I think we did a pretty good example of that. I think today we might be more interested in um, spawn points and kind of some just models in the scene. But these are all here. They're uh, worth playing with. Trigger volume in particular I think has a lot of uh, capacity that I haven't fully explored myself. Um, so worth pointing out. And then lighting types. Obviously we have uh, five types of light. Um, and there, you can do a lot with those, um, especially when you consider that you can anchor those lights to other, um, to something like a trigger volume. You know, you could have a, when you walk into the room, the light turns on, um, I believe. So things to play with. We'll look at those in the future, I'm sure. Um, but all worth looking at. So I'm going to 
click on, I think this terrain that they default into the scene is like a really interesting example that shows us our hi hierarchy. So you can see that the hierarchy is like a uh, roster. Uh, it's the roster of the inventory of every piece of media that is represented within your scene right now. Um, and do something of a autopsy of them. Here's the skybox. Um, skybox can uh, is really cool. It's pretty dynamic. Let's um, just play with some of those sliders and show not tell. So this is luminescence. Here we get a bit more scattering. Could always change the time of day. Let's make it like a what a hour and a half later. Let's make it much later. Let's make it. Guess and check is the name of the game sometimes. Just trying different times of day, see what I like. Yeah, that's fine. Um, do a little more scatter. Yeah, this is not really intending to make something specific. I just want to kind of show you what this does. So, And then you can get a lot of effect with the horizon beginning and end. Sometimes a little silly to do first because it is often um, kind of dependent on what you've done in the foreground. And directional light, um, that sends light in all directions. Um, there's this phenomenon that I won't go too far into that the sun is such a powerful lamp that essentially like covers the entire surface of the planet with like reflect with light that's like refracting uh, and light is like bouncing off of so many things that it basically serves that light is going in all directions when we walk around at like noon um, and so directional lights are kind of getting at that um, you don't see you see shadows um, but like um, yeah I, I don't know I think just leaving it at light that's being sent in all direct uh, that light that's illuminating the entire scene but is going in a single directional path that's how i should summarize directional light i think um i'm gonna skip spawn point for a second because i want to circle back to it at more length um i'm also going to skip floor plan because i actually uh it's kind of complicated and will generate itself i think um the thing worth noting is that if you're having issues with floor plan it's worth going in and regenerating your floor plan after you've done all your editing um because it is procedural um and if you're having issues where your scene won't build and is having a nav mesh error it's likely that you have um pieces of mesh that are crossing each other in ways that suddenly it can't automate the process of regenerating the floor plan or nav mesh um go back and kind of move around things that you've added to the scene or have moved in the scene since you last built it um, and last published it. I guess it's called a publish in Hubs, sorry, not a build. Um, it's a it's probably the trickiest issue you'll run into in Hubs. It's, it can be very frustrating for sometimes, but you can understand why it happens. It, it just, the floor plan can't be generated in some geometries, um, but that's um, just a word of caution. And Finally, we get to our terrain. So let's take a look at this terrain. This is just another 3D model. It's a GLB, which is very similar to GL, uh, or GLTF. rather. Um, let's click GLTF info and see what exactly this is using up. So we're using eight megs within our scene just for, um, just to have this terrain, which, you know, in some circumstances could be a really good use. Um, I guess today, I last week just went ahead and just threw that or a couple weeks ago rather just went ahead and threw that away because i said oh that's too much um we can't really use that um i don't know what do we want to do today maybe we're making a meeting room let's go ahead and let's keep it let's um let's maybe use let's see if we can find like a house model or something to drop in there and we'll take advantage of some of the scenery so we'll leave it um spawn point that's what i want to get to this is where your user, like, this is the door. You kind of can think of this as a door to your room. This is when somebody opens up the web page, when they go to your URL, this is where they will physically spawn within the scene. Um, you also, kind of importantly, get to control the direction they're looking. So um, that brings us to these top left corner 
Um, we have a drop down menu that lets you save your project and stuff. This is probably a good time to do that. Let's make more project. Twitch demo. Whoa. 7720. Did I put the month of the day first? Let's have the Europeans and the North Americans fight it out in the comments. Um, now, I'm going to show you that we can move our uh, assets, in this case the spawn point, um, using translate. So when you click that um, kind of compass rose looking guy, um, it's going in four directions from an origin. You can see I can move using these little sliders that anchor themselves to the asset. And you can see those changes were represented in the position um, in the transform uh, I don't know, set of fields uh, within the properties window. Um, I can switch over to rotate. I think that's hotkey R um, to switch over. I don't use a lot of those hotkeys within hubs because I often have multiple tabs open. It's just kind of, I'm not smart enough. Um, and so you can see that I get 90 degree rotation there and you say, oh, but what if I don't want to snap by 90 degrees? Um, the degree of effect is in this, if you continue down this column, you can change how much it default snaps. I vary, I'm typically at one, uh, one degree. So you'll see very fine that almost, it's so smooth. You can't even really tell what's happening in one in discrete one unit or one degree uh, jumps. Um, you can get really close there. You could be like, oh, that's about what I want. And then you might look at it and realize, oh, that's pretty similar to like negative 35 degrees. Or there might be some, you can kind of switch between feel and math. Um, and I personally really like that. I like to be able to jump around, do a little guess and check, feel it out, move the things on the screen, and then come in later and add the math of like, oh, it makes sense. This was actually a 45 degree angle I was going for here, or this was a 27 and a half degree angle, and my eye liked it because it was so close to that. I can just snap it to that. So worth mentioning. Uh, the same can be done for the amount of those translational jumps. Uh, you can move that down to 0.1 meter so that it's very fine movement um, you're likely going to have to go through that process of since 0.1 meter is like you know these sizes are tougher than rotation rotation is kind of absolute but these um, translations are not always you're more likely to have to kind of guess and check to get something in the right spot and then fine-tune it uh, I'm thinking in particular of if you're trying to like make a painting look like it's hanging on the wall it's very important that down to like the pixel from profile view, um, or not maybe not the pixel, but practically the pixel um, from profile view that there's no space between the wall and the painting that's hanging there. So you might end up getting it as close as you can by eye and then doing kind of guess and check, bringing it down by the lowest sig fig, um, you know, moving it by 0 0.001 in the to bring it closer and closer to the wall until it looks just right and then you go a jump further and it looks worse and then you can jump it back you know uh, if anyone has questions about what i'm talking about there feel free to throw it in the chat um, but i think hopefully that wraps it up pretty well so let's go ahead i'm going to delete this spawn point because i did a lot to it there and we'll actually put spawn points back in in a moment i uh will leave it without them so let's do some really fast, let's actually throw something together so that I don't end today's stream having not made anything. Uh, let's search for a house. It's cool, I like the chalet. I think I've used this in the past. Put that there. Uh, I'll use my last of those three tools I didn't mention. This is definitely the kind of strangest of them. Um, you can click this box and get an even scale in all dimensions. It's really nice. I don't know if it's strange. It's just a little bit more unique. I don't really find myself using the green, blue, and red bars very much because I often want like a consensus kind of scale. So we've got a chalet there. Let's just always check our items to make sure that they're as oh that's like a beautiful asset wow um using half a bag only one material very few triangles very cool that's one of those google assets that we were talking about um let's try to find some more though let's 
a schoolhouse. Oh, and here, this is a great example of how items will come in at drastically different scales. So what do you guys think? I think that's about three times the size of our chalet. So let's use 0.33 to bring it down to a third. Yep, they're about the same size, but now seeing them next to each other, I kind of wish the school was a bit bigger. So let's try 0.4. pretty good together. Um, it's noting, it's throwing this error here, uh, not really an error, but an issue, um, that the chalet uses a texture that is larger than 2048 um, pixels wide. So I'm going to let it stay, but it's, it is a point that we have that we could have optimized. Um, let's throw, I just want to get kind of a little neighborhood going here, so I'm going to take a wider view. And I am happy to receive any questions in the chat as I go about this little bit of quick prototyping work here. Control Z does work, thank goodness. Okay, maybe we'll make that a bit bigger. I'm thinking like point three. It feels like it should be a lot bigger than the other stuff, right? I want to show grouping quick, so show you that we can take one um, little house, get to the scale we want, and then I could click it, Control C to copy it. Control V to paste it. But wait, it didn't paste. No, it's directly overlaid on top of the other house with driveway. And how do we know that, uh, that your command worked? It's because it appeared in the hierarchy, even though we don't see it. You always trust your hierarchy over what you see with your eyes. Um, because now when I go to slide, it's gonna slide right out. They're just on top of each other. So um, I'm gonna make a couple of houses that are very close to each other. I'm using shift. Uh, and click to allow me to click multiple items that are within the view. And then if they're both highlighted in blue, um, that'll happen both in the hierarchy and in your scene view, which is nice. Uh, you'll press control C, control V, and now you can see it's there. Let's do a little rotation. Pretty cool. Um, let's take all four of those. We can also click them in the hierarchy. I'm holding shift as I click those house with driveway lines. And then I'm gonna use a right click and group. So it's named it group. And here we have a drop down. Uh, this is kind of cool. So you can see since I'm selecting group, um, when I modify the location of that asset, all four of its sub assets, its children, uh, as we call them, um, are being moved around using this, uh, responding to the changes you're making to the overall group. Um, so that goes for rotation. That goes for scale. It's really useful for scale because um, maybe you got everything consensus, then you're like, oh, wait, but my, you know, um, I stacked all these dominoes next to each other, but I realized all the domino, each domino needs to be 10% bigger. Uh, you could select all the dominoes and scale the whole item, uh, but how do you track if there's multiple groups? You can click the group, you can name it four houses, you know, just so you can, it's gonna get complicated. Oh, four houses, enter. Um, it's gonna start to get complicated as you get these really complex scenes, you know, um, so that's that's worth doing. Um, let's go ahead and duplicate our four houses. Um, just to show off that you can have 
groups of groups. Pretty cool. I'm sure your imagination runs wild when you realize that. Because there's, um, I'm a big fan of a VR application called Maquette by Microsoft. I think it's really cool how it allows you to make um, very symmetrical layouts in VR systems. It's really difficult sometimes in 3D editors. You can get uh, to get things to look um, either perfectly symmetrical or um, kind of organically symmetrical. And I think this is a set of tools that kind of does a sim similar thing. Um, so we've built a little village. Um, I don't know what kind of economy this village has. It's a very cineplex driven one, but they do have a nice school, it looks like. Uh, let's throw something in the middle that's really gonna pull the town together. Yes, a spooky cemetery. Let's put that there. Scale it up a bit. Got that. And then I think this might be where we actually put the majority of our stuff is this gazebo. Um, cool, this is the first opportunity I think we're getting to show how you deal with things clipping through the floor. Um, it's kind of exactly what you'd think I'd imagine, but lining it up right can be a bit of an art rather than a science. So we're gonna switch over to um, our translate and we'll just do this by eye at first. You can see I feel pretty good about that. Um, and you know, within my own hubs, I likely would leave it there. But for the sake of showing what I mean about getting it perfect. Oh, the, okay, so that surprised me. The terrain is only renders one way. So you often can uh, look at the, like below the floor. And so like if you're in the apartment below you kind of, and see when it stops poking through the, um, stops poking through the floor. Um, I actually don't want to use a gazebo. I want to do a treehouse. It's going to look a lot cooler, I think. Um, and we might do some uneven scaling here, too, because we might... Oh, oh. It's pretty cool. Okay, and then... How about we make this kind of the focus of our space? And this is where we'll put our spawning spots back in. So let's put spawn point there. And you can see that I've largely screwed a lot of the scale up here. So um, let's try something drastic. I think I have selected everything except the crater, you know, it looks like these aren't selected, but the house group is selected, so. Um, and now I'm gonna do a, I'm gonna move them all up in size. Cool. Okay, so let's scale to everything. Got rid of some of the empty space too. Not sure the cinema necessarily thinks their business is being done justice as we put the cemetery in front of it. So it's, and you can see how you get pretty fluid combining some of the tools we've talked about pretty quickly. So just do quick, I don't expect this to look particularly good, but we're trying to show off what we're doing. <clears throat> So we've got ourselves this fella and let's choose which way she's looking when she enters the scene.
And it looks like our mesh is going a little bit over the ground here, but I don't mind it. The, it's, the undulations of the ground are going to make it so it looks like that no matter what uh, in some spot in there. And maybe, you know, I'm going to reach for it. Is there a cul-de-sac? Try traffic. Intersection. Hmm. Kind of like that. <laughs> Would maybe use that if we have to. Let's throw that into our assets, though. If you're in the Twitch folder right now, there is a second document called July 7th Online Assets, and I've pointed that um, out there. You can see that some of you are following along in the other folder, so just want to make sure you're aware of it. And let's grab that throw it in there and I don't know what does one, one x scale look like eh, 0.8 0.7 0.6 0.5 that seems about right so I want to show you something about scaling if you click this unlink scale you can change the scale by um, any of its core three dimensional planes. So you can expand it, like let's just double its size in the X. Yeah, and then we can double it in the Z, but we have not really changed the height of these trees or anything, right? So it stays the same in the Y. Um, don't know if that's necessarily the best use case for it, but I did want to show that off. And then um, I can always do a little bit of rotation to kind of respond that this the size actually feels about right to me, but. Um, quite a town, quite a town we're building. Okay, cool. So I think that does a good amount of set work. Um, I think that's the thing within hubs people are going to jump into easiest, but I do want to show it off because it's pretty core to having a good time using hubs is understanding how to bring media in that you didn't necessarily have to make yourself. Um, I think... Lots of cool opportunities there. Um, let's create another spawner that will just be, in case you bring somebody in with you, you don't want, um, if you always want more than one spawner in a room, essentially. I, I think there's probably exceptions to that fact. If you're building a, a maze or something, you essentially want the spawner to be at the start of the maze. But like, if you want it to be a maze that people can do together, you need two spawners at the front of that maze. And that's to avoid... Uh, having a bit of a pile up as you as people walk into your space um, they very easily could spawn and then say oh okay well while this page is loading up i'm going to go get myself a cup of coffee and they spawn into the room and they're still standing on that entrance in that entrance way and when the next person comes you know you got to think of it like a door if somebody walks through the door and stays in the doorway they don't move their character um, the next person spawns in and they're right on top of them. The first thing they're seeing is, you know, the interference from two people standing on top of each other. It just doesn't look as good. Um, I like to make multiple spawners that are pretty close to each other. So people might enter the room many times and not even realize they entered through different spawners because they're so close. Um, when we do libraries hubs, um, we have an entrance room in our floor plan um, that will be consistently utilized. Um, and I, I, I don't know, that's just a best practice. Um, there are other um, VR applications that have had pretty serious issues with that. I don't think hubs really has. The spawner system really works pretty well. Uh, let's give, let's make one more spawner that's in the, oh, control Z, control C, control V. Um, let's make one that's in the crow's nest. So talk a little bit about locomotion. I think I want to wrap in about five minutes here. Um, so I have some time for any questions people have at the end. Um, locomotion. So players by default, you don't have to build, you know, this builds off some A-frame web VR kind of infrastructure, but you don't have to build your own um, controller in the scene. It, by default, your controller 
uh, for users. I mean, the sorry, the user locomotion is defined by the room, not by like this template scene that the room is launched from. So whoever is owning the room uh, can control how whether people can teleport or have to use the directional buttons, whether like lots of stuff like that. Um, but you do by default have access to both teleport and uh, ASWD or you know arrow key uh, controls. Um, so not something we need to talk about today, but a consideration you want in your back of your mind for like how is somebody getting down from this crow's nest? You know, I've put them in a position now. I probably wouldn't actually. Oh, that's funny. I turned the whole world. Actually, might like that better though. Um, I probably if I was making this for like a libraries event or something i wouldn't put a spawner up here i just kind of want to show that there are different advantages we can get as we get in the room i would think this would confuse somebody and kind of scare them if they just spawned into this spot standing up here so um but you can move them they don't have to be yeah so i'm going to delete that just for sake of not encouraging bad practices but uh we have about eight minutes left i'm gonna go ahead uh let's actually look at our elements and make sure there's nothing else we want to add um a light could be cool. Do we have time to do a light? Um, yeah, we do. Let's put a point light here and just like crank it. Let's turn it to 20. Oh, that looks really neat. That really looks like there's like stuff going on inside of there. I'm actually going to control C, control V. Um, so this is one of those elements you have to be very careful with because um, these lights take up a lot of um, computing power, essentially. You don't really ever want to have more than four dynamic lights in one of these scenes. So how about I just actually crank this really high and turn the range up a bit. Uh, and yeah, lots of stuff you can play with lights. I think lights are probably a topic we can talk about in the future. I will make this light gold rather than Just a white light. They can kind of bleach character faces a bit. Um, if you make it a white light, uh, black, pure black light has kind of the inverse effect where you can't really even tell the light's being thrown very much. Um, yeah, pretty cool. I don't know if that's necessarily the best use of a light, but I, do, I just want to show it off to you. Okay, um, let's publish it. Oh, sorry, let's throw a sound in. What do we want to do? Maybe a, is there like a park? I remember there being a park. Yeah, city park. What do we think? Anybody's in the chat, throw a message in. You can pick the music. We can go city park ambience, city park music. I like the sunrise one. Let's throw that in there. Uh, I'm not going to worry too much about spatializing this sound. I'm going to put it, this sound behind the hotel, kind of, but I'll make it loud. Uh, and I'm just going to make it stereo. Um, that's going to let us get around a lot of the questions about spatial sound, which I do want to talk about in a future instance, but not. we're not going to have time to that. Uh, and I pretty much added a sound so I can make my point about hubs. Uh, I see lots of really good hubs creators who, myself included, their most common mistake is forgetting to check this controls box for items that they don't want users to be able to control or to have to see blocking their view. Uh, let's turn those controls off. The controls really can break the teleport command um, because people will be searching around with their mouse trying to pick where, we'll, we'll look at the teleport in about a minute here. Um, I'm going to press publish, by the way. Um, up in our top right corner, there's a publish button. I'm going to press publish to hubs while I keep talking here because it's going to take a moment. Um, and let's make an attribution. I want to find out who that intersection was by to make sure Bruno Oliveira uh, made that. So I want to, thanks to Google Poly and Bruno Oliveira. And I do not believe we used anybody else's assets besides Poly, but I'm gonna go back through and look after we get off the off the Twitch today. Um, 
And people are more than welcome to remix this, so this will be um, there if you want to play with it. I don't think this is quite as good as the ones we've made in Bass Twitches, but feel free to look through other stuff we have up there too. So we're going to click Save and Publish, and it gives me like my favorite thing in Hubs, which is a report card. I didn't like them as a kid, but I really like them now. Um, and it tells you your polygon count, uh, how many materials you used, it color codes basically how well you followed the best practices. And you can see we have that one flag that we knew about, you know, it was over here the whole time that we used one texture that was too large. But, you know, it is really interesting to look that because of that one texture, we ended up pretty close to that safe video RAM number, uh, which allows mobile devices to join the scene. But we stayed under it because our scene is very small. But um, so overall, we did pretty well, but you know, if this if this was a report card I got and this was a scene I was actually trying to make be super accessible, you know, that's why it would be so small. I would probably go back and remove the chalet um, because of its texture. So, but I'm not going to do that today. I just want to raise the point. So let's click publish scene. And it's going to give us. I think it's going to upload pretty quickly, or maybe not because I'm. Um, but this is a great way to. Thank everybody for coming in today and checking out our workshop. Um, I see that we're dropping some frames because of that upload. Um, we're going to continue to have these kinds of workshops here on Twitch. Uh, we're going to be covering a lot of content, a lot of different topics, uh, particularly for VR, makerspace uh, topics, digital media. You know, we have a lot of uh, expertise in house, and we want to share it. We want to make it available to you. Uh, both the NC State community and anybody from the public is interested in what we're doing. Um, we really are uh, open face here to help. Um, so I hope this was useful. Uh, I have my information at the bottom of the screen at go.ncsu.edu slash Colin. I am more than happy to dedicate an hour of time to hop on either uh, this platform or another to get together and take a look at some specific issues that you might want or need help with, um, particularly if they deal with anything real time, virtual reality, game engine, um, digital media, lots of topics we can cover really. Um, so we're here to help uh, and I hope that this session today was helpful. Um, we're about to have this uploaded. Uh, Take a look at previous Twitch videos on this channel. If you're interested in this topic and specific questions you don't think we got into today, obviously welcome uh, the contact information that's there at the bottom of the screen. But in just a moment, I'm able to take a bit of a tour of our small um, look at what it looks like on Hubs itself. Um, just to refresh ourselves on what exactly we've built here. We have really built a template for a social scene that we can invite others to join us within, a three-dimensional scene. I'm again going to say no to the virtual reality um, offer for my browser because I don't want to use a headset right now. And I'm going to, uh, this is a remixable room. So anyone who gets to this page uh, would be able to edit in Spoke, it would open in their own Spoke editor, and they would make a, um, a remix, which is very cool. Uh, you can find other people's uh, scenes um, that you would like to re-edit. They're right on the Hubs homepage uh, at hubs.mozilla.com. Uh, let's create a room with the scene. And I'm going to enter room. Uh, if you have an Oculus Quest, you can click that enter on standalone. It gives you a little link that you can join through. Very cool. Um, let's go ahead and I'm going to use, I have two mics hooked up. I'll use the second mic. Cool. So, hey, 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 we're in the treehouse. So we can see that we have spawned to that location that we put the spawners at. And I have something called fly mode on right now. So I'm going to toggle fly mode off. And it snaps me to the nearest ground. Is funny. So we're walking around on the ground here. Uh, for more information on fly mode or those other commands that you saw pop up, that's all in the, the hubs documentation. I'd encourage you to take a look at it. Um, there's a lot of cool commands that can be called like that. But here we're just moving around town. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to throw this invite link into the July 7th, 2020 notes document. If anybody wants to join, you'll have seen it pop up right there. And you can be on the stream at the last minute here as an avatar if you want. Um, I'll leave it open long enough that you'll have an opportunity to join. I'm 
We can go for a spooky cemetery walk. Pretty cool that because we checked the collision box on all of those assets, we left it checked really, um, it automatically like adds these to the mesh. So this was something that I thought was kind of hard to do in A-Frame um, to like make it so objects like blocked your path or had real physicality to them. Um, but it's just like a total breeze with no coding. We did no coding today. So um, pretty cool. I think these houses look pretty good next to each other. But if I was to make go back and make an edit immediately, I'd probably rescale just about this whole town. I feel like a total giant. Um, so probably something if anybody wants to remix and fix that, feel free to send it along to me. I'd love to use it. Um, but with that, I think we are at the end of our time, and I do want to respect everyone's time. I'm going to leave this hub... Uh, session open so if you do want to hop in and look around the room off without being on the twitch stream you're more than welcome to do so um but with that i will say goodbye for the day thank you so much for joining us here either on july 7th on twitch or in the future if you're finding this video useful uh to your work in the future in either case um do all those subscribe like stuff uh to your heart's desire but uh, more than anything, keep a look out on the uh, library's workshop page for future instances. We're going to be doing these on uh, Tuesdays for the next couple weeks, and then you'll see a whole bunch of them pop up for the fall. We're pretty excited about what we're going to be doing on this platform. So uh, thanks for being with us today, and have a wonderful day. Bye, everybody.